All right. Hello, Fortinas brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 22nd, 2024, and we are counting them down. Even though it's been so cold and it's finally warming up, thank you, Lord. We are counting it down. We are watching and praying because this is the most exciting year outside of the death and resurrection time of Christ and the time of creation. This is number one, uh, number three. One, two, and three, guys. I believe this is the year. You guys know it. We are watching and praying like crazy. We've seen Revelation for so long here, just exploding. And what we're going to get into tonight is some clips of others that are starting to see things be revealed as well. They're, they're starting to comprehend and to understand things, but I'm going to bring clarity to them. I know some of you uh, within the ministry and and just as you talk with others, they'll be talking about certain things. I want to make sure you can understand what they're saying, because what you're going to see is is they're seeing something they're they're getting it and they're not wrong but it's just mashed up together they they don't have the the placement and and the understanding of these things with the placement and and the timing of these groups and so i want to go through that i was shared these clips um over the last couple of days and i just thought it would be a, another great one to go into because what it does is it again continues to confirm what we've been revealing here. We've been able to confirm this. I mean, you want to talk about scripture, man. I mean, we've gone from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of revelations in the mysteries revealed in the is to come. And while it reveals the is to come, it's also given us a greater understanding in the is and a greater understanding in the was, which was from creation. And if anybody's new to the ministry, the was is from in the beginning until Christ. And then from Christ until now, until the time of the pre-trib is the is. And then from the pre-trib forward is the is to come. And like everything, pre, mid, post, um, you know, the, the, the bride, the church, Judah. I mean, it's all in threes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Luke, Mark, Matthew, the Synoptic Gospels. You'll come to see that that the Synoptic Gospels are revealed here in what we call the differences within the Gospels, the differences in who the Gospels are speaking to, and it's absolutely mind-blowing. When you watch a, a video like today, if you're new, you might be able to track some of it, but some might go over your head. So I always recommend starting in what we call the, right here, whoops, in the playlist, oh, give me a second. In the playlist here, in this intro series right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series, watch the first four videos, or you can go to ministryrevealed.com. This is the, the homepage for Ministry Revealed. You can go over here, click on intro, and you have the exact same four videos, but then some of the other ones change a little bit afterwards. These first four videos, if you're new, will begin to open to you the revelation of the end of days truly as it has never been understood before. And the clarity you will receive will totally open up your mind to the scriptures. It is that powerful. You will understand the differences, these, these, these differences within the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke. You know, in the end of days, the last will be first, the first will be last. That means Matthew, Mark, Luke. In the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. That's why there's a reason why the discourses are different. There's a reason why the stories that seem similar yet have clearly different wording in them, different day counts in them. It is all revealed here in the revelation of the end of days with who the Gospels are speaking to. This video is a 22-minute intro to the next three videos. It gives you an idea of what you're going to see in the next three videos. This is the first one or the second, the first of the three. And this is a 30-minute Bible study to begin to give you uh, a little insight into what these differences reveal to us. And it, it would be impossible, virtually impossible, to have understood these things before we had the Strong's Concordance at our fingertips. I use this program right here. I'm not affiliated with it. It's called eSword. And you see, we can have the, the differences, the, the meanings of the words at our fingertips and it absolutely explodes your understanding. And that's called eSword. 
I think it's a few bucks, five, ten dollars a year, maybe free, depending on your device. So this will begin the differences in the Gospels. You'll see Luke was arrayed in a gorgeous robe. In Mark, Jesus uh, was arrayed in uh, in purple. In Matthew, it was a scarlet robe. There's a reason. White, gorgeous, beautiful bride is the Luke group. Mark and Matthew, purple and scarlet, the tribulation colors. What that then reveals is when you realize these differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to, you'll realize that the end of days is 14 years. The whole church has missed the seven years. They've only seen one seven. And the reason they've only seen one seven and so much confusion is because it's all because of Matthew. So these are all these are 30 minute intros to the differences in the Gospels that will then lead you to the understanding that Mark, which is the world and the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel, that is the first seven years of seals. The seven years of trumpets are to Judah. And when the 14 years begin, Judah is destroyed and they're scattered so that the land can rest for the first seven years. Then the rebuilding and the things that people generally talk about happen in the second seven years. I promise you, this is only a 30 minute intro. It will blow your mind. It is so incredible. And it's just a taste. And what you'll see is that it reveals the discourses. So Luke's discourse is a portion above the 14 years, which is 50 days. So that's the Luke portion. The bride goes first, then there's a period of events of 50 days, and then the 14 years start. And it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. It does not mean one seal per year or one trumpet per year. That's not how it plays out. It's just that there are seven that play out over seven years. And they're mixed and mashed, and some start, one stops, some overlap, that type of thing. What you'll realize is how then were the seven years missed? Well, one, it wasn't yet the time. But two, it's because everybody has been taught for hundreds of years from the foundation of the Gospel of Matthew. And they've only gone to Mark and to Luke of the Synoptic Gospels to say, well, we'll get a little insight here and a little insight here as to what happened. So Mark and Luke are very much less studied and Luke even less than Mark. And because of that, everybody's foundation has been through the eyes of Matthew, which is Judah. It is through the eyes of Judah. Theirs is the seven years of trumpets. And so it has caused crazy confusion. So when you hear somebody going to Matthew 24, they're essentially talking to the second half of trumpets. They haven't realized what it is they're saying. And you'll, you'll see from the Luke, Mark, Matthew discourses that pre, mid, and post are absolutely all true. And it's not only that. We can reveal it from places all throughout Scripture. It's absolutely incredible. Then from there, after those four, you can go into the deeper things. This is a three-hour deep study on the differences in the Gospels. Here's the, the discourses revealed in order, Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's, it's incredible, incredible stuff pre, mid, post, all being true, I promise you it will be worth your time, whether you want to go to ministryrevealed.com or whether you want to watch them right here. So uh, with that, as I was saying, we're going to go into some of these videos and we're going to we're going to study some of these clips. One is only eight minutes, so we're essentially going to watch the whole thing. And you're going to see, again, this confirmation of a group of people that will serve the Lord, but where and how he ties it and the things he talks about, he confuses it with other pieces of scripture. So I want to bring clarity to it. Not to, it's not a browbeating or anything like that. I'm excited because other people, other pastors, other ministries are seeing these glimpses of these things, but they just can't get the understanding of the order and, and what it is they're actually pointing to when they're talking about certain scriptures. So even though they're talking about something early, they, they end up pointing to something much later. And I'm going to show you it. I'm going to give you the understanding. And, and by doing this, because we've covered so much in scripture over the last six years and a bit and revealed so much and opened the prophets, the Psalms, the, the law of Moses, right? The, all of it, Torah, the, the gospels. I mean, it's incredible what has been happening. So what can happen now is by going into some of these, and I'm not going to do it all the time, 
But by going into some of these, because they're being shared with me, we can pull things out. And by doing this, you can be helped in clarity. I know not everybody understand it, uh, understands it as clearly as I do. The revelation is coming through me. But I know there are many who understand it virtually as much as me. I know there are some who kind of really get it. And then there are some who, who understand some of these differences and the years. But, you know, if they were talking with somebody who said, well, what about this scripture and what about this scripture? And, and they're overlapping these things and confusing the time. You might be a little bit caught off guard trying to trying to adjust those things and say, well, no, let me show you why this is placed in the wrong spot within that conversation. And so things like this will help you to discern it better, will help you when you're listening to other ministries to be able to discern these things, where they are and what they're talking about. And so that's why I want to go into it. And so and because when it comes to one with. um with Stephen Bendenoon, it was shared with me um, in the forum. Oh, by the way, you'll hear me sometimes talk about the forum. You can go again to ministryrevealed.com. Click right here. Click on the forum. It'll take you, I don't know, five, 10 seconds to sign up. And um, it's free of charge. And there's a, about, about 1,200 people around the world, um, some more active than others, of course. But we're sharing events and prayer requests and Bible studies. And we've got brothers and sisters now all over the world having Bible studies. Not everybody, but a good number of people. And our brother Ivan in South Africa, I'm just so excited by that. I mentioned it last time. He's now doing Bible studies at his church on prophecy. Absolutely thrilling. And there's a group of ladies that have gotten together. There's six of them that have gotten together. And I'm going to soon, we're going to share uh, on that as well on what she has put together, what one of the ladies has put together from the, the revelations here in the ministry. But that's got a lot to it. So we're going to work on it a little bit more. And uh, in the coming weeks, we'll definitely be sharing on that as well. We'll probably do a live show. So um, with that, the, 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 the forum is where a lot of these things are shared. And then some people send these things to me directly, either in the forum or uh, via email. And the one that came in that I saw today with Stephen Bendenoon was great because, again, we're going to be able to see where he mixes two portions of time of people together, yet what he talks about in relation to one of them is a great little nugget for us because we've understood it in the pre-trib remnant worker bride. And we know that there is another remnant worker group which are the 144,000 at the end in the seventh year of seals that will help at the end in that seventh year of seals and then will remain during trumpets. We know that events happen there. And so you're going to see him combining these things, but he gives this really good little nugget in relation to this portion that is for trumpets. And so it's going to it's it's really exciting and we're going to we're going to dissect it a little bit and go into these different things. And we're just going to have some fun digging into scripture and helping with more clarity and hopefully helping it, uh, uh, helping others, you know, be able to understand how to see these things and better pick them out. And before we start, I'm going to show a little clip of this. And again, this is something else that was shared with me. You know, I've shared a few of these recently because it is blowing my mind. These people that have gone that have had true experiences, having gone to heaven, having gone to hell. Their lives have completely changed. It is evident in their change of life and how they live and what they do for the Lord. It is evident by the Spirit in them. And when that happens and something is shared with me and I'm listening to the these segments that people share to tell me to listen to, it just jumps right out at me. And it's so, so exciting to share. So let me show you what it is I'm talking about. With this one, we'll start uh, at the 23.15 mark. So just over a minute on this one. Let's have a listen to this one. Hi. Here, one second. Well, we're going to have to Mike Holmes. Mike Holmes. I've partnered with Basement Builders because we share a lot of the same values. I built All right, let me, uh, let me bring it to here. I set up the other clips at the right spot, and I forgot to do this one. 
All right, have a listen to this. The only way I could describe it in the physical would be if you closed your uh, right eye and I was looking at him, he had on what I now know to be, I didn't really at the time, a priestly robe. It was a purple robe. It was so fine, so beautiful. Purple and then sort of bluish hues here and there. And then he had on his chest this uh, golden kind of a sash and across it were very precious stones. And then in his right hand, he had a rod like a staff. But if you were to close your left eye and look at him, I saw his mighty crown. He was wearing his robe was this pure white that was just so different. It's hard to describe. It was just so, but it's so beautiful, so immaculate, so spectacular. But it's not like some people do nowadays. They're just their attire is just way overboard, and everything's you know. It it portrayed his it portrayed who he is. That's the best way I could describe it. It was not show offish at all, but it was marvelous and spectacular to behold. He had a golden sash going down like this, and I was seeing all of that at the same time. I was seeing him as our high priest, and I was seeing him as our king, the king above all kings, all at the same time. How awesome is that? Now. For those of you who have been tracking for the last little bit, I think you'll understand exactly what it was he was seeing. So he was seeing purple, right? He was wearing the high priestly uh, um, uh, uh, garments. And then with his other eye, he was seeing him in his kingly attire with his crown. All at the same time, but through one eye, this, and through the other eye, that. Well, how perfect is that, brothers and sisters? Don't we, don't we have an understanding of precisely where that is, this period of time right here in the seventh year of seals? When he comes at the end of the sixth year to start that seventh year of seals, when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion, when at the end of the sixth seal, everybody's freaking out and they're hiding in the rocks and saying fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb right for the great day of his wrath has come well what do we know about that what if we go to Zechariah chapter 6 we've shown that the two witnesses the typology of these two is revealed in joshua and in zerubbabel we know that zerubbabel is the branch because he's the one who's going to finish and build the temple. Whereas Joshua, the high priest, right? We know, and we've been teaching here for a long time, we've shown that Joshua, who is a picture, a typology of Yeshua Jesus, is the high priest and king. He's the high priest and king. Remember, he is the, he is the uh, uh, um, Messiah ben Joseph. He is the Melchizedek. Oh, wait a second. He's the Melchizedek. That rings a bell too, right? So here we are. Even for those that are new, I mean, you go to our chapter or to, our chapter to years, there's your end of the, the sixth year of seals. And where are we? Zechariah chapter six. It's a typology of that end of the sixth year of seals. Here he is coming. And he's the high priest and king. And of course, we've talked about Zerubbabel in the past. There'll be a modern day Zerubbabel coming. And what is he coming as? He's coming as high priest. Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua, who is going to bring them over into the promised land, which is heavenly Mount Zion, paradise that he's coming with, the place prepared, just as he said he would come back and receive them in John chapter 14. Now, where else does this connect? Well, what if we go to Hebrews chapter 7? Look at that. They just so happen to be in this line or from the very end of this one as they see him coming, like the end of the sixth year of seals. And what happens when we go to Hebrews chapter 7? Remember, he's Joshua, Yeshua, high priest and king. And what do we get? The typology, the picture of Jesus, who is Melchizedek, the high priest, the most high priest of God and king. He saw him wearing purple in the high priestly garments and the other side as the king. When the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal, at that seventh year, he is going to be Melchizedek, high priest and king. Just as we've been teaching, just as we've been showing the whole way through. So where we were able to show even within chapters to years, I can even show you another one in chapters to years. If we go to Genesis chapter 14, watch this. Genesis chapter 14. So we got Genesis chapter 14. We got Hebrews chapter 7. 
we got the picture at the end of the sixth year of seals and we have john chapter 14 coming on coming with paradise the place prepared so what happens if we go to genesis chapter 14 just to really hammer home this point what do we get malchizedek malchizedek shows up the high priest and king how perfect is that well guess what it gets even better because look what happens when we go to psalms 110 the famous psalms 110 that people like to talk about psalms 110 verse 1 a psalm of david the lord father said unto my lord son jesus sit thou at my right hand till i make thine enemies thy footstool the lord father shall send listen to this the rod of thy strength out of zion what did he see him standing with he saw him standing as the high priest and king he saw him standing with a rod in his right hand as well right so here he is coming as high priest and king the rod in his right hand rule thou in the midst of thine enemies verse four uh, verse four the lord father has sworn and will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of melchizedek the lord yeshua jesus at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath see all of this is the end of the sixth year seals when he's coming as high priest king melchizedek with the rod in his hand just like revelation chapter 12 right so what else do we see at this in relation to the chapters to years what is he going to do he's going to sit at the right hand of the father at this point in the differences within the gospels let me show you something in the last chapter of luke in the synoptic gospel so luke is for pre mark is mid matthew is post and what do we see at the end and it says uh in matthew uh, sorry in luke 24 49 and behold i send the promise of my father upon you but tarry ye in the city of jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high there you go you see it's not the same is it this is a group who's going to this is we all know that this is related to the remnant worker bride that is going to remain after the pre-trib and then they're going to be here with the lord for 40 days as the son of man and they're going to work during seals at least they're going to receive this what we call acts 2.0 look what happens when we go to the end of mark this is now a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals here's the lord coming it's a picture of the 144,000 and the powers that they're going to be given. We've shared on it many times. We've got some great videos on it. And then listen to what it says in Mark 16, verse 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. We didn't get that in Luke, didn't we? This is one of those things in relation to the differences in the Gospels and these prophetic insights that are hidden in the differences in how the stories are told, not only the differences in the words that are given, like the events, but not and also not only the, the day counts and so forth, but even the stories that are told and what is told in one and not told in another reveals prophecy for the end of days. So in Luke... There was no going to sit at the right hand of God. But at the end of Mark, which is what? The end of the sixth year of seals, when he comes to start the seventh, and when he's Melchizedek, high priest and king, and what did it say? He would sit at the right hand of the Father when he would be high priest and king. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So what is he working with them, confirming with signs following? Well, again, this is to the 144 at the seventh year of seals and what do we see in revelation 14 the lord is there on mount zion with the 144,000 who have the father's name written in their foreheads these guys are protected you see but we know something happens in there but these guys are protected right so because they have the father's name they can't be left right we know this we've, we've shared on this it leads down a trail that's really hard to imagine until you understand the scriptures being revealed listen to what it says in matthew chapter 28 matthew 28 at the end go ye therefore all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth just like the seventh trumpet this is when he comes at the end of the 
13 years of tribulation. He's coming at the end of, at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is 13 years of tribulation. And he's going to fulfill that final year. And what does he tell them when it's all over? He's now talking to a group then at the end of even that 14th year. And it says that this group is going to go out and they're going to teach. Go ye therefore and teach no more preaching because the whole world seen them coming as lightning from one end to the other. Hey, they're going to go teach, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Because now he's going to be here with them till the end of the millennial reign. So you notice that these differences, even by going to the end of the synoptic gospels of each, you have a different conversation taking place. And in all three of them, they are remnant workers. There's a group during seals. There's the group at the end of seals that works trumpets, which is the 144. And then you've got from the tribes that will go out and work during the millennial reign. They're the gates through which everybody will come to worship the Lord and observe the things that they're supposed to till the end of the millennial reign. So when, when we see something like what he's saying here, and, and we see the connection to high priest and king, and we know the timing of the high priest and king. We know that the connection to purple is connected to the, the end of Mark with the robe color, which, again, we just recently shared. Um, when Christ is going to be crucified, in Mark, it's not a robe, but it's garments. So he was arrayed in purple. Am I in the right chat? Uh, where is it? I think I'm in. Oh, let's try 15. He was arrayed in, there it is. He was arrayed in purple. So here's the main purple. And if you go to John, that is really a tribulation timeline built within it. And the remnant workers, or the 144,000, I should say, that work during trumpets, they come from this group, which is why they're sealed first in chapter seven before the great multitude rapture, which is the mid-trib. So if they come from this group, what do you think the chances are that their color would be purple in John in relation to the latter portion of trumpets? And you see, they come from, they're a different color, and it comes from the one from the Mark group. It's fascinating when you understand these things. So here we are talking about purple. He sees them with purple. He sees them as high priest and king, he, which, is, which is a Melchizedek picture. And the timing is 100% to the end of seals or the end of the sixth year of seals when he comes for the great multitude rapture at uh, um, in the seventh year of seals. It's awesome. The, I like these types of things. You know, I, was, I wasn't a, a big fan. I'm not a, a, too big of a fan of dreams and visions um, unless the, the people I'm getting them from that receive them. I know them and I've seen and I've I've taken part in in being able to to see what it is they're saying and find out what scripture reveals about it. But these are strangers that I don't know that people watch and they share them with me. And I find these these types of things, which we've shared a few of them lately. We can prove. We can prove in all the ones that we've shared. What they've seen in relation to the timing. And this was another one. So I just wanted to share that because I thought it was just so exciting. So now let's go to the next one. Hey guys, it's Tony Robbins. Oh, Look, another commercial. It's January. It's a new year. It's a new life. And just too long now, to pause. By the time so I pause and get back, it'll already be going. All right. So now this one is only about eight minutes in a bit here. So we're going to listen to it. And even though this conversation is a once saved, always saved, and you're going to see what it is that's really being spoken about, um, and you're going to understand it's kind of, it's kind of like what we talk about. The focus here isn't really about once saved, always saved it in a roundabout way. It is, but it's not really, but, um, you're going to see, I agree with him in what he talks about, but you've often heard me say that, that we, we don't know. And so when, when it gets to a point, I'll stop it again to, to let you know, this is the point I'm talking about here that. Even though people fall away, you know, the, the question could be, well, were they really Christians? And that's always the debate of once saved, always saved. 
you know, they say, well, no, if somebody was really in Christ, then they couldn't have fallen away and, and converted and gone to Muslim. Well, you can't know that. I can't know that. None of us can know if that person is really saved when when they're in church, when things are happening and and they're reading their scriptures and they love the Lord. And then suddenly they slide away a little bit and then they start talking with friends and they start looking into Muslim writings and they become a Muslim. And you say, well, that person wasn't always saved. So once they've always saved, well, that doesn't apply to that person because he obviously then really wasn't saved. Well, the issue is, how do you know? You see, we don't know it yet. And that's that's really the conversation that's going on here in that were they really Christians? Because what's happening is the the easy Christian is being pushed everywhere because we're in this Laodicean age, you know, and th this time of just, hey, call out to Jesus. Just say, I believe in Jesus and say this prayer and you'll be saved. Well, that's not all there is to it. And so that's some of what he talks about. But you're going to see he's going to go into a piece of scripture. And, <laughs> you know, when he goes into the scripture, this is where I want to bring clarity. Because a lot of people go to the scripture. And all you got to do is read the stuff before it and the stuff after it and say, well, that clearly has nothing to do with right now. It's prophecy. But if you don't use the Strong's Concordance, it can make it a little bit more difficult, but not really. Strong's Concordance helps make it more clear. But when you see the stuff written around it, you got to say, well, why would you guys think it's now? And so I'll share what I'm talking about when we get there, and, and I'll break it down for you guys so you can understand what's being said and why people go to it. Very, very important to me. Um, it's the topic of the day. And the reason it is, is I'm going to read a scripture here from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul the Apostle says, that day will not come except the apostasy comes first. Now, what's the apostasy? I'm reading this out of the Amplified because they explain it. Unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. And so that is something that was prophesied back in the days of Paul. And Lisa, <clears throat> today— but wait, wait, you know, I, I can hear people right now listening, saying, well, wait a minute, isn't once saved, always saved? So what does that mean? Can, can somebody profess and then regress to a place where they're no longer a Christian? I think the bigger question is—because that's, that's an excellent question— yes, uh -huh. the bigger question becomes, were they even saved in the first place? I, Jesus is invisible. You can make Jesus however you want, and you can make salvation however you want if you take selected scriptures out of the New Testament. However, if you look at the overall counsel of the New Testament, salvation is made very, very clear. Now, we have got statistically, and this one shook me up. This is the whole reason for the Awe of God tour. Okay. And in, from 2000, the year 2000, till present day, over 23 million people have gone from practicing Christians to non-practicing Christians. Oh, excuse me, to non-Christians, not non-practicing, non-Christians. Okay. So they are either atheists, agnostics, or spiritualists, or absolutely nothing, which I guess would be agnostic, correct? Uh, or atheists, yeah. Or atheists. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a great example right there. You see, there are 23 million in the U.S. who are now saying since 2000, I guess it was, that they're no longer Christians. They had professed to be Christians. They had claimed Christians. They had believed in Christ, and they're no longer believing. So... There's your, well, what about once saved, always saved? So what he's talking about and is going to go into is, of course, Second Thessalonians. And we know that, of course, we're talking about the seven churches, right? This lukewarm period. So if we go to the seven churches, which we know of the end of days, we're right here, right now, in the apostasy age, right? In this present age. But as soon as the pre-trib happens, I mean, as soon as it happens, it will now become the time of Ephesus. We've, we've taught on this. We've got videos on this. It's fantastic to be able to understand the prophetic end of day seven churches now revealed. And it's in the book. I mean, we've known this for a few years now. And it'll start over at Ephesus. But right now we're in Laodicea and the apostasy age. So. With that, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is what, because a lot of people like to quote this like he just did. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be, except there come a falling away first, comma, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now listen to what it says. 
who uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, clearly, this has not happened. This hasn't happened. This is clearly a later into tribulation period of time. But why do people in the church that share on these, why do they go to it all the time? There's two reasons. One, because they only believe in seven years. That's one issue. Okay? So what they would believe would happen is that we're in the Laodicean age, and the vast majority of teachers, preachers, teachers do not understand that the seven churches will play out again in the tribulation days. I, I've said it before, you know, um, uh, um, Chuck Missler, before his death, he, he had always desired to understand these things in, in relation to the seven churches for the end of days, but he never got to understand it because he knew that the seven churches would play out again in the end of days, but he never understood how in his lifetime. But most don't most do not most believe that we're in the laodicean age and it'll be the laodicean age until the 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 temple is built and it'll be during this time uh, uh sorry during this time of apostasy and then the temple's going to be built you see so what happens they're expecting that this great falling away will go and continue right and get worse but people can come back. You'll, you'll hear him talk about that. And we've talked about that as well. And then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. So where do most people connect the son of perdition to? Seven years, they put it in the middle. You see, that's because they've all been taught from the gospel of Matthew. When you're taught from Matthew and you only have seven years based on Matthew and you're trying to fit everything in it, you put the son of perdition in the middle of the seven years. Well, guess what? You're absolutely right. It is in the midst of the seven years of trumpets. Unfortunately, it's the ten and a half year point of tribulation. And this is something we have been able to prove over and over and over again. And I'm going to show you with all of these scriptures. Okay? When does the son of perdition show up? Well, if we go to Revelation chapter 17, we have... Um, the beast, right? Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. The beast that, that, saw, that thou saw was and is not, because we know what happens. He's there for the second half of seals. He's killed, and he's not there for the first half of trumpets. And then he will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So when does he go into perdition? It's mid-trumpets, about 10 and a half years into tribulation. Perdition now comes. Where does perdition come from? The bottomless pit. We know he was cast down there when the Lord came at the end of the sixth seal to start that seventh year, and he was cast into the pit, and then he's going to come out of the pit when it's the shall ascend out of the pit and go into perdition. But how else can we show it? Well, all we have to do is go to Revelation chapter 9, and we see the fifth angel sounded, star fell from, from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So... When is the pit opened that the beast can come out of? He's not coming out until the fifth trumpet. So you see, the fifth trumpet, what has happened is when people only see from Matthew's perspective of seven years, there's many different ways that they see these things. They'll say that either the seals are the first three and a half years and trumpets are the second three and a half years. And so that's why they would say, see, there's where your son of perdition comes. Others will say, well, it's sandwiched. Like the, the one seal, one trumpet, one seal, one trumpet, one seal, one trumpet. So you have a seal and a trumpet together, a seal and a trumpet, a seal and a trumpet. And they believe, others believe that it's that way. They've never been able to see that they're, they're separate periods of time. And so they put it in the middle-ish time frame of the seven years. You see? What they failed is because they've missed the first seven years of seals. They've got it seven years too early. Or I yeah, they've got it. They've got it. They they've got it seven years early when really it's going to be 
seven years later from where they think it is. But now, why is this important to understand? Well, all of it is tribulation related, right? So when you're trying to go to this and say that there's a falling away first, and then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, you got to say, well, where's this falling away? And because they don't understand the seven churches, they would say, well, we're in the falling away. Now you start to scratch your head. And we've mentioned this recently as well. Because if you're in the Laodicean age, how on earth during an age of apostasy and falling away are you going to get into an age of the apostolic revival? If it's just going to be Laodicea in the church thinking that we're in the Laodicean age and this falling away will continue until the man of sin be revealed, well then, where are you in an age of a period of time where there's going to be the greatest revival in human history? You have an issue. Because you're not going to get the greatest revival in human history in the midst of apostasy and falling away. Where does it happen? <laughs> if you're new, watch the video on the seven churches. I believe it's it's on that uh, playlist in <clears throat> excuse me in the uh, on YouTube and also it's uh, the seven churches are on the website there as well on the same page and where it is this is mid trumpets time this is mid trumpets when the pit is open and the apostasy happens you see that's what's taking place and there's this is a great connection there's a reason why I'm also going into this in relation to its connection with what we're going to talk about with Stephen Bendenoon. So in, in having this conversation and going through this, let's see what else it tells us to prove that it's actually talking about the end of days. This is why having a program, <clears throat> excuse me, like ESORD is so important. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, um, even if you read it without the word definitions, it sounds prophetically future as well. So what about this word coming? We've shared on this many, many, many times, right? This word coming, G3952, and why it's so important to understand? Because it shows up four times only in the Gospels, and all four of them are in the Gospel of Matthew. All four of them are in the Gospel of Matthew. So you can see why there's why it's important to understand why it's all connected to the Gospel of Matthew. Let's go have a look briefly, and we're going to be connecting these things to Matthew as we keep going as well. So let's have a look at this. Knowing if you're new, what I told you earlier, that the differences in the Gospels and what they reveal to the differences in the discourses is the pre and that 40, 50 days of, of Luke's discourse Mark's is the seven years of seals. Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. This is why you're not seeing the word coming in Luke or in Mark in relation to when he is going to be seen by the whole world at his coming. So here it is right here. Listen to what it says. There it is. Halfway through. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Listen to this. End of the end of the world. Didn't we just read the differences in the Gospels? At the end of Mark, uh, at the end of Luke, Mark, and then Matthew, and it was at the end of Matthew where he says, "And now I'm with you until the end of the world." So there's this coming, comma end, which means separate in addition to the time to the end of the world. So now listen to what it says. Let's keep going. Look at where the other word shows up for coming. Where is it? Right here. Matthew twenty four twenty seven. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, that's precisely it. This is when he's coming on the clouds for the whole world to see him. And it's at the end, at that 14th year of trumpets. No, I mean, at the 14th year of tribulation, the seventh year of trumpets, is when he's coming on the clouds for the whole world to see. As lightning from one end unto the other. This is why people are so confused in Matthew chapter 24. They try to read Matthew 24 and tell you that it's pre-trib. I used to be a part of that group. I barely went to Mark and even less to Luke, like everybody else on earth that teaches prophecy does. 
until the revelation started September 8th of 2017. And it has exploded ever since. I mean, look at these words. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's pre, all right. No, it's not pre, because he's not coming as lightning from one end, un, one end unto the other until he returns feet down. And when are they going to see him? It's when the Son of Man is coming in the clouds. We've shared on this many times. This is a great teaching of the differences in the Gospels within the Synoptic Gospels um, in the discourses. The word in in Luke, it's in single cloud. Mark is the word in plural clouds. But Matthew says in, but it should have been the word on. Look, it's the word on the clouds because that's when he's coming as lightning when the whole world will see him. And when is it? It's at the last trumpet. That's why it even says, soon as the seventh trumpet in Revelation 10, he puts his lips and the seventh trumpet begins to sound, the mystery is over. That's the Lord coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the 13 years, right? Feet down at the start of the 14th year of tribulation, and which is the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. So now look at this, keep going. And then it says, but of that day and hour, Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming, same word, there it is again, the coming of the Son of Man be. Every single one of these comings is 100% related to him coming for the final 14th year when it will be the days of Noah that play out as one year in the days of Noah and 10 days because this is the final 49th year in the cycle of Jubilees, and that final year is a year and 10 days to the Jubilee. Oh, you keep listening, because you're going to see how all this connects. So we can see it, right? And it says, uh, there it is again in verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. All this is related to him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of 13 years to start the 14th year. Every single one of those times. So when we see it here in 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, and it's the coming and the gathering to him, and it's the day of the Lord, the, the day of Christ that's at hand, that there was a falling away that came first. This specific falling away is directly related to the second half of trumpets when Satan has been cast down and when the pit was open, you see, there's a falling away. And then the son of uh, the, the son of perdition is revealed. Who's going to exalt himself, uh, claim to be God. Uh, we go to verse seven, second Thessalonians two for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken away. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall concern, consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his, there it is again, with the brightness of his coming. Even, because he's coming as lightning from one end to the other, right? Now listen to this. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So what did he say he's going to do? He's going to consume that wicked one who is the beast and the one who has the powers after Satan, who is the false prophet. And you know who it is because it says who's given, who is given uh, power for signs and lying wonders. So when do we know this is? Well, clearly we can show where the end of it is. We can show where it begins at mid trumpets, 10 and a half years in where that cutoff takes place. And then we see when the Lord returns feet down and here's that war in Revelation 19, which is the treading of the grapes of the wrath of God. And look at what happens. In verse 19 of Revelation 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the throat on the horse and against his army and the beast that was the wicked one. That was the beast declaring sit in, in the throne after the temple was built in the first half of trumpets. And the beast was taken, and with them the false prophet, 
You see, the false prophet has this power with the with Satan as well. The false prophet that wrought miracles before him. And they were what? Both cast alive into the lake of fire. This is from mid trumpets to the end of trumpets. Well, I shouldn't say this is from mid trumpets. This is the this is the 14th year, the beginning of the 14th year when the Lord returns as lightning feet down. He's telling you clearly. He's telling you when he shows up at mid trumpets time, right? Because it's at the it's at the uh, uh, fifth trumpet, and he tells you when he's going to be destroyed. It, and all of this can be found in Second Thessalonians chapter two, and it was connected to Matthew's discourse in relation to the coming of the Lord. So clearly, this is absolutely unequivocally connected to mid trumpets. And to the end of the, the, the time of trumpets, when the Lord returns as lightning. But I understand why people read this all the time and think that it applies to now. Because we are in Laodicea, and being in Laodicea, they're expecting, you know, if even if they believe in pre-trib, and the pre-trib happens... There's still this, we're still, quote unquote, in the Laodicean age, according to them. So a bunch of people aren't going to come. You see, most people don't believe in pre, mid, and post. They believe in either pre or mid, and then generally they all believe in post because that's the Lord returning. And then some don't believe in pre or in mid. So you get all these variations of what people think this means. We are in a falling away time right now. We are in the Laodicean age. The only thing is, is when these guys are trying to explain it, they're explaining it to the wrong period of time because they think that this falling away is going to continue. Yet at the same time, you're going to see in this next part, they also expect that people can come back in this time of revival. Well, that's completely contradictory if it's a time of falling away. Because the seven churches have to start up over again. And they don't understand that. So yes, we are in Laodicea falling away time. But we're not in this one that's connected right now. This is 100% absolutely unequivocally prophetic for the future time of tribulation. All right, so let's keep going. Now, the thing I want to say right up top is, first of all, Paul never wrote that they would never come back. So you're saying that there could be a falling away and then there could be a return. Yes. Okay. And if That's I look news. at John the Baptist, he went in the spirit and power of Elijah and he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I think there's going to be an Elijah anointing coming forth. And I believe it's going to be a multitude. It's not going to be one guy. I think it's going to be sons and daughters. And I think it's going to start with the sons and daughters. I think it's going to start with the gen. There you go. You see, this is another reason why I wanted to share it. Here's another pastor. He's had some great videos. We shared a, a clip of him in the last couple of videos or something like that as well. He's, he's got some great teachings. He's on fire. But you see, he's now also believing that those who were lost, those who, who claimed to be Christians and then fell away, that they still can come back. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what we talk about. They probably really weren't in their faith. They probably really weren't in faith. So that's the argument that a once saved, always saved person has. Oh, well, they probably just weren't really Christian in the first place. Otherwise, they wouldn't have fallen away. Yeah, but you don't know that is the point. We don't know when we're sharing with somebody if they're actually going to come to Christ, if that seed planted is going is to just fall on the rocks or if it's going to fall on good ground. Just like when they somebody comes to believe and somebody tells you you're a Christian, you're like, hey, fantastic. You know, hey, what about this? What about And they're like, uh, yeah, I, I don't really know too, too much. And then you think, well, what's their walk like, right? You start to ask, and you're like, hmm. That's kind of what he's saying here. You don't really know that, you know, are they really Christians? So that's where this debate always comes from with one saved, always saved. There is no such thing as one saved, always saved. And when they claim it as, well, if they were really, truly saved, well, of course, if they were really, truly saved, but you can't know. That's the whole point. So can they come back? And in saying, can they come back? He's talking about, in a roundabout way, he would be saying in a revival, something that would cause these people to come back. Well, to be able to have a, a comeback, to be able to have this revival take place, as so many people talk about, you need it to start over at the apostolic age where the revival could start. So you can't remain 
in the Laodicean age in a time of falling away. And that's why the revelation of the of the seven churches for the end of days is absolutely absolutely astronomically incredible. So let's go back a few seconds. I think it's going to be sons and daughters. And I think it's going to start with the sons and daughters. I think it's going to start with the Gen Z's and millennials. I love that. Okay, so now he's talking about a piece that we've been talking about here for a long time. That's what I believe we're doing here. We are preparing a remnant. I'm not saying everybody in the ministry and, and those that we're reaching and everybody's going to be a remnant worker for the Lord. But I believe there is a significant amount here within the ministry because of all of the revelation, because of this preparing. You know, you don't give you don't start to reveal the playbook to your leaders, to your team and then say, all right, now the game's going to start. Everybody go home. It just doesn't make sense. So we understand these things, right? As, as in heaven, so upon the earth. So we're understanding these things. We're being prepared. We know in Luke 24 that that's the point at the 40 days when the Lord is going to open the rest of that understanding at that banquet meal. So we know this is coming and he is seeing it as well. And what's he saying? The Elijah-John connection. You see, just as there was a John the Baptist who was an Elijah type, he's now going to go into, <laughs> excuse me, a section where he says, well, if you look at it here, it's as if there's still one to come. That's exactly what we teach. We absolutely 100% know there is the one to come. So let's have a listen. And there's going to be men's service and maid service. So we get to be included, Lisa. And they're, they're going to go in the spirit and power of Elijah because if you look at Malachi, he said, I'm going to send you this, the spirit of Elijah before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, Jesus clearly made clear that John was Elijah to come, but he said there, Elijah is coming in the future tense and John was already beheaded. That's Matthew 17, okay? I'm, I'm thinking about the Youth of Flame days. I am, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. There we go. I, I did a whole series on that. Yes. And so I believe these people are going to be sent to the lost sheep of the church, not the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the church. Okay. Don't get me wrong. God's going after the lost sheep of the house of Israel too. So. Now, obviously, you just heard there, he has a difference of opinion than me. I believe the church is grafted in, right? So if you're grafted in, if the church, if the Gentiles are grafted in with the house of Israel, well, then they grow together. You get it? There is no separating them. You see, when it comes to this replacement theology stuff, people generally, when I've listened to it just recently, people have talked about, you know, Jews. So they'll say, so Jews aren't really the Jews anymore because, you know, this replacement theology. No, that's not what, that's never what I talk about. The Jews are the Jews. They are their portion. But it is the house of Judah that is all spread throughout the earth because the Gentiles are grafted in. So after thousands of years of mixing together, they're all scattered throughout the Gentiles. And that would be the church. That's the one numerous as the stars, which is why Abraham is the prophetic picture when he's coming into the land of, of promise, like we see in Hebrews 11 and sees the place where the foundation was laid, which is what takes place during seals, you see, because Abraham is with that multitude. That's the prophetic picture. Well, there's no way to get a multitude, which is the great multitude rapture, unless at that mid-trib great multitude rapture, the church is the house of Israel because the Gentiles have been grafted in and they're all mixed together. But you see, he's now talking about this this difference um within let me go to that in malachi so he talks about malachi chapter four as well but we see in malachi chapter three so let's have a look at malachi chapter three we haven't talked about malachi in a while and we'll start in chapter three verse one behold i will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me okay so that's that elijah john the baptist type right um, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Hello. So if he's coming to prepare the way first, and we know that the preparing of the way happens during seals, so there's going to be all of this division because when, when the pre-trib happens and the Lord comes in for 40 days after the wedding, he's coming to what? Well, he told us in Luke, in Luke 12, he's coming to bring division, right? He's coming to separate mother and father and son and daughter. Let's go to that real quick. It's in that latter portion. We're going to come to more things in Luke chapter 12 with, uh, with the other video clip. So we see this part must be ready. We know the three worker groups there. And then Jesus tells them, in verse 51, 1251, suppose you that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. 
Well, isn't that interesting? Let's let's ponder this for a second. Let me let me read the next two verses and let's just ponder it for a second. So I'm not come to bring peace. I'm come to bring division. Um, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, uh, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. Well, hold your horses. Didn't we read, doesn't scripture tell us that John indeed came first and united father to son and mother to daughter before Jesus showed up? John was killed, uh, beheaded. He was in prison two months after Jesus had shown up and been baptized. He was there for about two months then put in prison. He was in prison for about 10 months and then he was beheaded. Hello. Did not John come to unite them? This kind of seems like a dilemma, doesn't it? If John accomplished it already in the is back then, and yet John is now dead, and Jesus' words are here from him speaking, and John had reunited them? Only for Jesus to show up and bring division? You see, we've talked about this many times in that when, when you get the end time eyes, that's what we call it, when you begin to see these things and it becomes so crystal clear for you with your end time eyes to be able to see all of these places in Scripture that have opened up and revealed themselves, it's very hard sometimes to see things in the is of the events that were supposed to have taken place. Because when you read from here down, your loins girded about, you know, when he returns from the wedding, there's three watches. The first watch is the first group he meets with. Second watch is the 144. The third watch are the tribes that, that are the gates through which people enter during the millennial reign, as we talked about earlier. We see that what's going to happen when the Son of Man comes and and one of the you know one of the 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 servants of the lord is going to go and beat some of the other servants then the lord the the lord will delay his coming it will to that servant it will be like the lord delayed his coming because he wasn't watching he will cut him asunder he won't be aware of the day and hour all of these things are prophetic the whole story is prophetic the whole thing here. If this wasn't prophetic, then how on earth did John the Baptist bring them together? Hello. Right? If John the Baptist was the one to have completed this, or when Christ showed up, only to have Christ show up and say, no, nah, I'm dividing everybody. John would be like, uh, uh, Lord, uh, I, I just reunited them for you. It's prophecy, guys. It is prophecy. And when you understand it, when you can see it, it is incredible. So let's go back to Malachi. And you're going to see in a, in a bit, you know, he, he said that, you know, uh, um, when, he, when he spoke about Malachi would do this, uh, uh, that, that Elijah would do this, he's going to refer something back to the Gospels as well. So why also is it important to see the word covenant? Well, first of all, we know that it's the Elijah John the Baptist, which is that remnant group. That's why I'm showing this with this with this pastor that he's talking about this this group that will bring about this revival of people. He didn't use the word revival, but that's what he's talking about, bringing in this group of people. And they're going to be the Elijahs, the John the Baptists that are going to do it. Unfortunately, it just doesn't seem that he understands it's going to be during tribulation. But this is what we know brings us to the end of the six-year time frame of seals. And who shows up? The Lord, the messenger of the covenant. Because remember, at the end of the seventh year of seals, in that final few months, the Lord makes a covenant with all nations. We know it is the Lord who makes that covenant with all nations. Many people thought it was the Antichrist because they only believe and understand seven years. So they think it is the Antichrist and his rulers that are going to rebuild the temple. 
Well, they're in for a surprise if they're left behind because there's seven years and only a foundation being laid. And it's World War III, and then the Antichrist with the Mark of the Beast comes. So they've got six and a half years before the, the great multitude mid-trib rapture. Imagine the confusion. Imagine the confusion, guys. Could you imagine if the, the revelation of the truth and the understanding of the Gospels in 14 years was never made known? And the tribulation comes, and there was no group prepared by the Lord for it? And everybody's thinking just seven years? You want to talk about thinking delaying coming. People would be so confused. So, so confused. So, again, we know this is to the end of seals. We know at the end of seals, there's his covenant. Listen to what he says in verse 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Listen to this. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. What do we know about the workers during seals? Remember, the Levitical line are the ones spread throughout the 12 tribes. So when we see the 144,000, we see Levi, and then we see the other 12. So we see Levi replace Dan, and we see Joseph replace Ephraim. I think they're actually all Levitical lines because they're all, they're all spread throughout all 12 tribes. And what do we know happens at exactly this time? What do we know happens at the end when he's prepared the people? What do we know happens when the Lord comes with the covenant that he's making with all nations? What do we know when he's coming to purify these people? Well, it's the time of the seventh year of seals. And who comes first in Revelation chapter 7 before the great multitude rapture? The 144,000 are sealed. You see, all of these things are in order. Well, check out this nugget. You want another piece to show you the understanding of the timing? Verse three of Malachi, uh, verse two of Malachi three. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is as a refiner's fire, and like listen to this, Fuller's soap. Fuller's soap. What? Why would you have Fuller's soap? Well, 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 isn't that interesting? Aren't we telling you, haven't we been able to show and reveal that this, when he has prepared them, when the Lord has come during the 40 days, he's dividing them so that people have to make a decision. And so they're going to be against each other, which is why the discourses, right? Remember this in the discourses? Even from the beginning, during the 40 days, while well, the Son of Man is here, remember, he said he's bringing division. So where do we see division between mother, father, son, daughter, right? We see it right here. Um, and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And look what happens when we go into Mark's discourse. In the first half, the first, uh, the first portion of the 14 years, the first two and a half years, we got nation against nation, and then listen to what it says. Verse 12, now brother shall betray brother to death. And father the son. And children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. What happens when we go to Matthew? Well, of course, you guys know it if you've been following for a bit. That conversation of mother and father and daughter and son and everybody doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Just many shall be offended. Some shall betray others. But it's not father and son, mother and daughter. And why? Because during time of seals towards the latter portion, the Elijah, John the Baptist types, the, the Moses, uh, John the Baptist types and the Elijah types, they're all the same prophetic picture of that remnant worker group. Like he said, isn't just one person, but a group of people. That's exactly what we've been sharing in the ministry forever. And so this is why you're seeing it in Mark. So look what happens now in relation to what Malachi said about the fuller soap. So we know end of seals. We know he's coming with the covenant. We know that the sons of Levi are, are being uh, uh, sealed. And then it says in verse four, 
then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord. You see, when does Judah come in? When does the Lord go back to Jerusalem? Right, he comes down, and then they're going to be rebuilding at the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. And who's going to be there also? Judah's going to be there, just like Zechariah 8 says. The great multitude rapture comes in first, and then the Jews will come in after, but they're not going to paradise. They're going to, uh, to uh, uh, Jerusalem. Because the Lord is on Mount Zion. He's there with paradise. Well, what else can we use to prove it? Well, how about this? What about the fuller's soap? Okay, check this out. In all of the Gospels, did you guys know that this is only found in one place? Check it out. In the New Testament, in the Greek, it's only found in one place. And for those who have been following for any amount of time, we know the importance of this story. The transfiguration. We understand why Luke says about an eight days. It's almost the time of the eighth day, which is a prophetic picture of the eighth year. And in the timeline chart, you see the end of days is seven years, seven years, seven years. But the first seven is the bride preparing, uh, the spirit preparing the bride. And then the 50 days happen before the eighth year. Okay, so the seven years are almost up. They're almost there. It's not quite the eighth year. So what does Luke say in his transfiguration? About an eight days. It's almost the eighth year. It's the days to years in the uh, prophetic typology. We've talked about that before. So why does Mark say after six days? Because after six years of seals, after six is the beginning of the seventh. So we're at the exact same time frame as we're reading there in Malachi. And what do we know? Look at what it says. Mark 9, verse 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth, used one time, so as no fuller on earth can white them. You see these little clues? Even a word from the Old Testament to the New it's used one time in the entire Greek, and it's in the prophetic picture of the timing of the end of seals, the end of that sixth year when the Lord's coming. We've shared this before, this word, right? No, can, uh, none can make them white. And what did it mean? They had to make their garments white. Well, what am I talking about? Well, if it's connected to the time of the end of seals when the great multitude rapture is going to happen, why don't we go look at the great multitude rapture in the middle of Revelation chapter 7, and what do we see? Verse 7, verse 14, uh, halfway through, these are there, they which came out of great tribulation and have washed, and have washed, laundered their clothing, right? Their robes and made them, there it is, white. It's only used twice. To the group where every single part and portion is talking about the time of the end of the sixth year of seals in that seventh year of seals. The entirety of this conversation. We go to Malachi chapter four, and then you see it right here. Five, verse five and six. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So again, if this was supposed to happen by John, why was Jesus bringing division? Unless Luke chapter 2 is prophetic. You see? So let's see what he, what he has to say next on it in relation to this, this connection of John and Elijah. But I really believe what created this falling away is we never truly preached healthy, and I can't emphasize yeah, enough, healthy repentance. Now, when people hear the word repentance, they think of a mean-spirited guy who doesn't love people. He's, he's in the ministry. He doesn't have anything else to do. He's been in the ministry for 30 years, and he wants to control his people's behavior. That's not repentance. Okay. Repentance, I always look at it as a man and a woman getting married. So Paul the Apostle makes this statement. A man's going to leave his father and mother. He joined to his wife. The two are going to become one. He said, but this is actually an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. If you look at Jesus, he's the groom, we're the bride. When you and I got engaged, you had to make a decision. When every groom proposes to a bride, she has to make a decision. What's her decision? 
am I going to break up with 3.9 billion guys? Now, of course, she's no, probably not dating. She's not dating yes. 3.9. But is, she's, is this the one I'm going to set my heart on? Is this the one I'm going to give my whole yep. heart, soul, and life to? And when we just do a formula sinner's prayer, hey, we, we, we preach the goodness of God, which we need to do because the goodness of God leads sure. someone to repentance. When we just preach the goodness of God and just say, hey, you want God? Pray this prayer. We've never said to that person, you got to make a decision like that, that bride does, the girl that's been proposed to. I'm going to break up with all my idols. Now, what's an idol? An idol is anything we put before God. It's anything that Jesus died for. We say goodbye to because he gave his life for me. I'm going to now give my life to him. Wait, and can I do clarity? Yeah, so clearly, you see, he gets it, right? Th that's the difference between somebody who's really saved and somebody who's not really saved. But you don't always know it because you're not hanging around somebody 24-7 to see how they're living their lives. And if they're really in Christ and, and seeking him and loving and repentant and watching and praying, that's the difference, right? He's coming for a bride who is ready, watching, praying, diligently seeking him, loving. On that, because Absolutely. Jesus didn't die for food, but Jesus died for us to have food in the right place. So I would say an idol is something that we have put in the wrong place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Because there are people that can have something good. Yes. In the wrong place. Right. So I just want to say that idols can be good things with misplaced value attached to it or, or too sin. much value, or they can be sin. Right. Absolutely. So if we don't preach repentance, and if you look at Hebrews 6, repentance is the first foundation of our relationship with God. So let's not lay again the elementary teachings of Christ, laying the foundation of repentance from dead works, then it's faith towards God. So there's really not true faith until we say, okay, I'm all yours. And this is what Jesus says in every gospel. The only way you can follow me is to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So basically, if we offer salvation mm -hmm. to people by praying a prayer, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, amen. Now I brought Jesus into my life, quote Jesus, with all my other sins and idols that I put before him. So now what happens is I have developed a really, a, not a real relationship with him. Newman's Own is a wonderful branding company started by Paul Newman in 1982. One of our biggest. So now, that fake Jesus doesn't change my nature. I'm still eating up So you're saying there's sin. no discipleship. There's no follow-up up where somebody says, hey, you've made a confession of Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life. And now this is what that looks like. This means that you say goodbye to this. You say no to this. You say yes to this. You have a community that is discipling. You're saying we've just kind of said, hey, where are you going to go when you die? Hell or heaven? You don't want to go to hell? Just say right. this prayer and I'm not really discipled anymore. I'm actually going to a deeper level. Okay. There's been no transformation. Okay. So the, the, the greatest blessing of the new birth is our old man dies. Our, our old spirit dies and a brand new person created in the exact image and likeness of Jesus is, re, is born. Mm -hmm. Now we are in communion with God, whereas before we were alienated from the life of God. You said we're actually enemies. Yeah, yes. yeah, but we were alienated. Absolutely. So now I don't have that changed spirit. So I remember my mom looked at me and she was furious that I got saved because I was raised Catholic. But she had to look at me un, unprovoked and she said, you've changed. And I remember saying to her, I never forget it. I, I know exactly in the house where it was. It was in West Virginia where I graduated from high school. And I'd come back from college and I said, mom, you have to understand, this is not me doing it. God gave me a brand new heart and he changed me. That's why I'm not as selfish as I was before because my mom used to weep because of how selfish I was, right? And so there was a change. I submit that when people pray just a formula sinner's prayer without repentance, without saying goodbye, okay? I don't believe there's a genuine change. Just there we go. So I wanted to add that to the mix as well. But he also goes into, you see, because that was, that's, that's salvation, guys. And you see, it's things like this that uh, even our brother in Uganda with our brother Steve and his team out there, this is what they do. They don't just preach and, and teach and do these things. They bring people to salvation. They, they let them know these things. They work with them. And that's why, Steve, and I'm not saying everybody that's out there in Uganda doing these things. I'm talking about our brother Steve that we support here in this ministry that him specifically and his team with the conversations I've had, this is the type of thing that takes place. This is the true repentance and salvation that takes place, that a change that they that they understand to, to make this change and to pursue the Lord and to set all those other things aside. Doesn't mean everybody's perfect all the time, but we're always working and, and growing to bring that, that relationship and to draw closer uh, with the Lord. So in a sense, you you can see if somebody is really saved by the fruit on the tree, how they live their lives. But if you're just meeting somebody on the street and you're just saying hello and they say they're Christians, well, you're not really getting a, a whole idea. So you accept them as being Christians. But you see, we don't really know for sure. So we pray for them. We try to lift them up and we keep sharing and planting those seeds. Maybe give them a little something about scripture and see where they're at. Right. So now the other piece in this is he was talking about also how it leads to Matthew chapter 17. So in Matthew chapter 17, 
And because we played it all the way through, I must have just missed when he talked about it. But he mentions that, again, you see, where are we now in Matthew? We're at the end of the 13 years of tribulation. We're at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. This is now the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And we get this conversation here, and it says, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, starting in verse 10, 17, 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first. You see, so a lot of people will point to this that do really dig into these things with Scripture, and they'll say that, see, this looks like a prophetic saying, there, there is still an Elijah coming. And that's what he's getting at. He says by going into Matthew here, there, there is this picture that there is still an Elijah coming. And Elijah John the Baptist, that is still to come. And it says, um, truly shall first come and restore all things. Of course, just like Malachi said. But then Jesus says in verse 12, but I say unto you, that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not. You see, and they did whatsoever they wanted to unto him, and they understood that it was John the Baptist. So there, there is, I could see what people say in verse 11, that there is this typology of saying, see, there is one to come. And I think that's a very fair assessment because we know it. We can prove, I mean, Luke 12 was very clear about it as well. We can prove that there is and Elijah John the Baptist to come. And that's what he was talking about, and that's what we've been talking about for a few years. So we know it's true. And when it says that he already came, well, what is it saying? They didn't recognize him when he came and restored all things. Well, when did he restore all things? At the end of the seals. You see? So that's why when you go into Luke, well, there is no question yet about John the Baptist, about the Elijah. You see, because when... Luke's disco, I mean, when Luke's transfiguration story is taking place, that's the conversation of the 40 days in the in the prophetic is to come. It is the picture of the Lord here for 40 days. That's the time while he's here bringing division. And what he means by that division is people are now going to have to make a choice. The end of days have begun. He's now here after the wedding, 40 days as the son of man to fulfill what he said he would do as Jonah did. So when you go to Mark's, that's where you should actually find the story first show up. And of course, that's exactly what we find. After six days, the end of the six year seals. And we see it first in Mark 9, verse 11. And they asked him saying, why say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. How interesting, right? Elijah is coming first, and we know, he then says, but I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they wanted, right? Whatsoever they listed. Look at the wording that comes in between here. And how it is written that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be set at naught. Well, if he's coming, at the end of seals, after John Elijah has restored in the latter portion of seals, father and son and mother and daughter and all of those things for the great multitude rapture, well then, why is this here? Why does he say in the prophetic understanding of where this is placed that he must suffer still many things and be set at naught? Pretty wild, right? We know why, right? We know why. Because when the ten and a half year point comes and the pit is open, we know that when the son of perdition comes, as we talked in the beginning of this video portion, that when the son of perdition comes, Messiah is cut off. The covenant that he made with all nations is cut off. This is why in Zechariah chapter 11, which is ten and a half years time frame approximately, look at what we see. That the Lord, in verse 10, says, And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people, and it was broken in that day. 
because it is the Lord who made the covenant in the end of that seventh year of seals. All of these things are in order. All of it. It's so fantastic to be able to follow these things, guys. There is a remnant worker group coming. They are going to be with the Lord for 40 days. They are going to be told in advance to be ready when he returns from the wedding. Then the pre-trib happens. Then he'll return. And on the eighth day, he's going to come to them. Let them know, have a meal with them and open their understanding. They'll be with them for 40 days, however that plays out. And then he's gone. And then Acts 2.0 will take place three days later. They will go out from Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be will have been surrounded in those three days. And then they'll be attacked and destroyed. And the 14 years will begin at the red horse rider. The 50 days in it, the 40 days of the son of man is the white horse rider. In fact, let me just show you a little piece of that. Just it was something that I had scrolled and gone back into again today. Let me show you a little, a beautiful little clip. This is the son of man when he returns from the wedding. Okay. Remember what it says. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals. So a lot of people say, well, if he's opening the seals, how could he be down here on the earth? He opened one of the seals. And then he goes out as the white horse rider. He is the white horse rider. He will be here for 40 days. And we're able to prove it, as I said a moment ago, because the red horse rider is when peace is taken. That's at the end of 50 days. And then that they should kill one another with a great sword. Well, that's the red horse rider, right? Well, when you go to Mark's discourse, it begins at nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And that starts with the attack and destruction of Jerusalem and the Jews fleeing to the mountains and, and killed and taken captive and so forth. That is the beginning of the 14 years. So what is this? <laughs> well, you see that a crown was given to him. When is a crown given? Well, let's check this out. In the seven churches, remember what I said, that the seven churches will begin again at the moment of the pre-trib escape. The moment of the pre-trib escape happens, and the Lord returns at the same day as the escape. He returns at evening, and he has his apostles who he's chosen, and he breathes the Holy Ghost on them. This will be the starting of the end of the end of days. The pre-trib happened, and this is that same day. And this is a prophetic picture of the first seven days of those 50 days. And the apostles that are chosen will remain at least during seals. And then when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day, as you guys know, this is the start of the 40 days within the 50 on the eighth day. And this is that remnant worker group that follow him for 40 days, that he opens their understanding, and then they're the ones that receive the Acts 2.0 anointing and then go out from Jerusalem. They will also remain at least during seals. But to start, this is a picture of the beginning and the first seven days. And what is it historically in the Old Testament a picture of? The day of Israel's espousals. What is it in our days? It was the time of the beginning of the church age, right? That apostolic age. In the end of days, it will be the beginning of the apostolic age, the revival beginning after the escape with people freaking out and crying out to the Lord and hitting their knees and the apostles anointed during the seven-day wedding to do their thing. And what's happening during those seven days? The day of Israel's espousals. Well, everybody loves to go to the Song of Solomon for that prophetic picture of the wedding. And look at what look at this. Psalms 3, verse 1. The bride's dream is the title. Just above verse 6. They it's not in scripture, right? The man has done it. Solomon arrives for the wedding. And look at what happens down in verse 11. Go forth, O you daughters of Zion, and behold, King Solomon, right? Remember that typology of Christ in, um, in Luke 11 in relation to he would be as Jonah was. One greater than Solomon is here. And what happened in Solomon's wedding symbology of this wedding bride? Behold, King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him when in the day of his espousals what's the connection to the day of his espousals literally 
when he's crowned and the day of his espousals directly connected prophetically to the typology of the was in the Old Testament to the is of the apostolic age. The wedding is taking place for seven days in heaven, earthly days in heaven. While the apost the apostolic age is beginning on the earth. It's awesome. That is Revelation chapter six. He is the white horse rider. It's it's so beautiful. I love it, man. It's so great to be able to see and to track these things. So let me go back. Where was I going to with that? Let me go back one more. See, I sidetracked myself. Whoops. <laughs> that's okay. I think that's where we were at at the end of that. So it's kind of like an in-between anyways. So we can see this. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, this falling away. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now hopefully you can see this clarity where, where they're, they're, they're incorporating, believing that this time of 2 Thessalonians in a seven-year thinking is, is still this pre-going into mid-seven-year trumpets, and they're expecting the temple to be built, and then he's going to set himself in it and declare himself to be God. So that's why they like to come to this and say, see, we're in this falling away, and this falling away is going to continue till about mid-tribulation mid of seven years, and then when the temple's rebuilt in the midst of it, the son of perdition will reveal himself. You understand that that's not possible? It is not possible if at the same time you believe that there's going to be a revival coming because you cannot have a, a revival in the midst of a Laodicean age, in the midst of apostasy and falling away. It happens in the Ephesus apostolic age. You following? That's why showing something like this, I hope, I hope brings clarity and helps you understand these things, bring, brings the, these scriptures to light and shows the connection to them, proving them out all throughout from beginning to end, the beginning of the book to the end of the book. All right, now, now we're going to go into this one here from Stephen Bendenoon. I'm, I might, I don't know if I'm going to share uh, all of the this time frame here, but I'll give you an, an overview to start. Sip of coffee first. And what it is in this is um, that uh, uh, what was I going to say? I was still thinking of the last one, you know, so you can understand that. He, he's talking about 10 and a half years later where the other one is, is he's also talking about pre-stuff, right? So hopefully that's cleared up. Um, but in this one here, what he's talking about is Stephen Benanoon found a nice little nugget. And it says, who was the lad Jesus spoke of? So he's really excited because he found this nugget of who the lad is in Matthew 18. Who the lad is that Jesus is speaking of. And he's going to go into it. He's going to talk about these places in Luke 8. Uh, sorry, in Matthew 18. And he's going to connect things to Luke chapter 10, which is just awesome because we know it's mid trumpets time. And you're going to see who he reveals it to be. Now, we've understood these things, but we understood it from different angles. Okay. We've talked about who the, the typology of the son of perdition is. But we know there is a prophetic future son of perdition. But his typology is somebody we know and that we've talked about. Well, ben, Stephen Bendenud makes the connection of who this lad is and who the little children are actually representing. Now, what's great about it and why I really like this is because... We did understand these things from different angles, but because even though we reveal all of these different worker groups during tribulation, our main focus is, of course, the beginning, right? This, this first remnant worker group, because that's the first group, right? That's the group being revealed these things to be prepared for when this time comes. That's what we're doing. But we understand these other groups as well. So when we talk about, you know, like the Lord, even in, in uh in Luke chapter 12 and the Lord is talking about um uh the the his 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 little flock right so here's an example right here 
right? When he talks about his little flock. So, you know, his little flock of sheep, right? His, his little children. We've seen it in other scriptures as well. He's talking to a group of people that are with him. And that's what Stephen Benenun is talking about. But where we talk about it mostly focused in the beginning, Stephen Benenun thinks he's talking about a beginning group as well in relation to a group that's really precisely the same thing as what this brother was talking about. Combining Second Thessalonians in a in a pre during the beginning of things when really it's later in mid trumpets and yet trying to connect it to a remnant Elijah John the Baptist group which starts from the beginning. So this is why I want to share it. It's a great connection and it it shows this confusion because of not understanding the differences in the gospels and that there's 14 years and the above. It makes everything open it just explodes your understanding when you understand it for anybody that's new i promise you those videos will be worth every moment of your time and again this isn't a, a beating down on them i'm excited that they're seeing these things that they're getting little insights here and there but i want to bring clarity to them that maybe they'll see and that others here that are watching can now relate it to others that they may be having conversations about with it. So let's start listening to it. And the, the whole conversation is about this lad and who he's discovered that this lad is. And we'll be able to show it in scripture too. If you know who the lad is and who the lad represents, then the rest of it will make sense to you. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter the life blind or lame than having two hands or two feet for you to be given to everlasting fire. If your eye should cause you to stumble, you know, pick it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than two eyes to be given to Gehenna. Take heed lest you judge one of the small lads. I say to you, their angels always see the sons of my father who is in heaven. Again, you go from that extreme back to that little lad, and he says to you, Take heed, lest you judge one of my small lads. I say to you, their angels always see the sons of my Father who is in heaven. Now it's in the plural. It started off with a singular, a lad, now it's lads in the plural. And the Son of Man has stopped saving the enemy. What is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them runs off, will he not leave the ninety and nine in the mountains and go and seek the one who has strayed? All right, let me let me take you back over here to Luke. So now remember, he's in Matthew and he's talking about a lad. So there was one there, there was a group of them there, and he has the one lad that he's talking about. And then he's talking about a group of these lads, right? A group of, of children and so forth. What Stephen Benanoon is going to show you is that they're not actually little kids that were just in the way, that were just like passing by. They were actually the apostles, the disciples. And he'll specifically tell you about who the lad is. And it's important to understand why it is where it is with the story in Matthew chapter 18. And now, of course, he's going to go into... Um, uh, I think Luke chapter 10, which is fantastic because we've taught on Luke chapter 10 many times to show that Luke chapter 10 is this prophetic picture of the 144,000. Let me go to it real quick. Luke chapter 10 is a prophetic picture. You see, uh, da, 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 before their face, Luke verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Okay, this is what? The great harvest. This is the, the great multitude rapture. But the laborers, those who work during seals, remember, some of them were killed. Some of the disciples that were with the Lord, those remnant workers, some of them are killed. So there's not enough laborers to bring in the great multitude rapture. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers uh, into the into his harvest. So who's he sending? This is why the 144,000 are sealed before the great multitude rapture. And look at what we see down here. They've gone out, 
this is also now a prophetic picture. They go in, then they're, they're going to work trumpets, right? They go into the cities, they do these things. And then what happens? They return unto him again. And in verse 18, and he says, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So as mid trumpets, you see, when does, when does Satan fall from heaven? Watch this. In Revelation chapter 12, there's the woman. This is the time of the pre-trip. There's the travailing in birth, the 40 days of the Son of Man. There's the pain, the first two and a half years of tribulation of seals, and which is World War III. Then you have the dragon show up. This is when he's going to give power to the beast in Revelation 13. We see here, um, then she brought forth a man child. So now the Lord comes. And look at what it says. Remember what we shared earlier? Shall rule all nations with a rod of iron. Remember when he comes as high priest and king, he'll have his rod in one hand. And her child was caught up. There's your mid-trib. Great multitude was caught up rapture. Then there's a place prepared for that woman where she's fled for 1260 days. What's happening during the 1260 days, which is the first half of trumpets? There's a war in heaven. While the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt in the first half of trumpets and, and the beast had been killed, there's war going on in heaven. Will people see it? I, I don't know. I don't know what this battle that will last two, three and a half years will look like. But then what happens? It's Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and his angels. And then that great dragon, the serpent, is cast out called the devil. And then... You see, and it's woe to the earth. Woe to all the inhabitants of the earth because he knows he's got a little time and so he's going to have great wrath. What does he start by doing? He's going to go after the woman with the flood and they're going to fly away into the wilderness. So again, this brings us back to uh, one of our old great pieces of scripture in Psalms 90 verse 10. Psalms 90 and 10, the days of her years are 70, and if by reason of strength they're 80, that's 10 years. Yet is their strength, meaning your strength to be able to go from 70 to 80 to go 10 years, is labor and sorrow. It's tribulation, travail, wickedness, sorrow, which is pain, affliction. For it is soon cut off. That's about six months. So there's your 10 and a half years, and we fly away. That's the flying away of Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, when they fly away on the wings of an eagle. So when then is this period when the dragon, when Satan is cast down? It's at the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet, which is two and a half years, or there are three and a half years left in the 14 years for which he gets two and a half years before the Lord returns feet down. And, of course, we know uh, the final year, which is the year of the, the wrath of the God, uh, the, the time of his judgment, the beast and the Antichrist we showed earlier, uh, the beast and the false prophet, I mean, are thrown into the lake of fire alive, and he's brought the grapes of wrath. Okay? It's when he comes as lightning from one end to the other. As Matthew 24, it's, it's, the, it's the year that is the year like Noah's. All of it. So we see that he is cast down at mid-trumpets, which is about ten and a half years into it. So if it's ten and a half years into it, and Luke chapter 10 showed them helping to bring in the great multitude rapture, then them going into cities where they're preaching and being like the evangelists because they're the 144,000, they're, they're uh, um, what church is that? They are Philadelphia which are the evangelists. So they're going and teaching and preaching. Then you see them come to the Lord and Satan, who was cast down as lightning. And they're given power to what? Tread on scorpions and on, and, and on serpents and on scorpions. And they have power over the enemy so that they can't be killed, right? And what does it say? That their names are written in heaven. Well, Revelation 14 tells us whose names are written in heaven. With this group right here, <coughs> excuse me, they have the Father's name written on their forehead. 
their names are written in heaven. We see this even in uh, John's gospel in 15, 16, 17, which is all in relation to the 144,000. So why am I bringing this up first in relation to what Stephen Bendenu talks about is because he thinks that the connection is a pre-trib group. You see? But let's let's keep listening. I scrolled up already there. Uh, what I want to show you here, if you notice, uh, as we were looking just a moment ago, verse 20, notwithstanding, see, they said, behold, I given, he said, behold, I given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not the spirits are subject in you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. All right. Your names are written in heaven. Now that was the 70 along with the 12 disciples that went out. Okay, so and when you look at that, that's exactly what we see that the, the, they, they all go out, but their names are written in heaven. Now, you might wonder, how does this all go together? I want, I want to share with you, right? Because see, in the book. So he's going to go to the book of Revelation. We'll skip over that part, but I'm just going to share with you quickly what he shares. And he's talking about this group. Listen to what it says. He's talking about this group right here. So this pre-trib group, and they sang a new song, they redeemed from all kindred and blood. And then here's a worker group that we talk about. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. So what he's talking about goes back to the same type of issue where, where the stuff that's pre and like all in the beginning stuff and, and the things that are towards the end or mid-trumpets are being combined as if they're the same thing. So he's trying to connect it to this group of kings and priests, and he's trying to connect it to Matthew chapter 18 with the group also from Luke chapter 10 when we know who the kings and priests are. The kings and priests are the Smyrna group who work for the Lord, at least during seals, who put their necks on the line, and they're going to be part of the first resurrection. But the rest of the dead aren't part of it. And they won't be hurt. They're part of the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We've shared on this many, many times. This is the remnant workers from the Luke group. Now, is it really a big deal that, that he's mixing these two together from Matthew to this group that's going to be resurrected to rule and reign with the Lord. It's, it's not overly a big deal, but it is confusing because you're, you're taking something that's from the start and you're connecting with the group connected to mid-trumpets. So there, there definitely is confusion there. You see, for those that don't know, Smyrna shall not be hurt by the second death. That's because this remnant worker group are going to be the ones resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. They're the ones that put their necks on the line. Some of you shall die, just like <laughs> Luke's, Luke 21 in his discourse says. So we're seeing that there's, there's clearly a difference within this period of time that he's talking about. But I really want to bring it home in what he's sharing here and go into these scriptures for ourselves and see why this connection is important and what it reveals when we read the rest of the story in uh, Matthew 18. Isles full of odors, which are full of the prayers of the saints. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And thou now, I, I don't want to go into a whole lot of, 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 the, of revelation here because the whole point is, is that there, the book that's in heaven is loosed. It creates a reigning upon the earth of kings and priests. <laughs> you see, it is loosed in heaven and causes a reigning of kings and priests. You see, that's the Smyrna group. That's when he returns from the wedding. That's the group that when the book is open, they're the ones receiving it. It doesn't mean that they're in heaven. I don't believe that they're going to heaven. We see in Luke chapter 12, they're to wait when he returns from the wedding. But we see there's something. Are they gone in spirit maybe to the wedding? But their bodies are here, kind of like John when he's in Patmos. 
right? For the book of Revelation, maybe something like that, but I don't believe so. But I, I would, that would be so awesome if it happened, <laughs> right? Could you imagine you're here, but you see everything, your, your spirit is taken and you're experience, experiencing everything for seven days in heaven. And then you come back and the Lord comes and knocks and you're in your body and you're like, oh, <laughs> that, okay, that would be awesome. And I would be up for that, right? But I don't believe that's what's going to happen. It's just who was able to lose the book? Christ was able to lose the book, right? But he loosens it by what? One seal at a time. And before that first seal is open, the pre-trib is gone, right? So you're seeing this group of kings and priests as well being mentioned. And it was a book that was sealed that only Christ could reveal. Well, you might think, gosh, what's that got to do with what you read over here about the little lad in Matthew? Well, let's take a look. And again, what I'm going to show you now is from one of the Egyptian writings here. And I only look at this in a historical context, not a biblical context, but look at what is written here after all these there came the little children also those to whom the knowledge of the father belongs mm. having been strengthened they learned about the impressions of the father they knew they were known they were glorified they glorified there was manifest in their heart the living book of the living the one written in the thought and the mind of the father which from before the foundation of the totality was in his incomprehensibility that book no one was able to take since it remains pretty wild already, right? A group of little children, those to whom the knowledge of the Father belongs, having strengthened, they learned about the impressions of the Father. They knew they were known. They were glorified. They glorified. There was manifested in their heart the living book of the living. Wow. This doesn't sound this doesn't sound like the like the 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 mid trumpets group. This sounds like the pre trib Smyrna group again. You see, what was it also from? Which from before the foundation of the totality was within his incomprehensibility. From the foundations of the earth. You see, with, with Stephen Benanoon, what he's found is a connection to somebody, but he's reading it. In the is, and and somehow trying to connect it with this with this is to come in Revelation, but he he's trying to do prophecy with with an is view. But the is view of what he found is really good because of what we could see with our is to come eyes, with our end time eyes, in what the rest of Matthew seven uh, Matthew eighteen then tells us. So again, do I think this is actually connected to what he is talking about in, in relation prophetically to the, the Matthew 18? No. I believe this is another document that was found. So he's, he said this was in, uh, was it in Egypt, uh, an ancient writing in Egypt or something like that? And again, more insight to the ones that are his little children known of the father belong to him being strengthened by him understanding being given the living word from the foundations of the earth you see i think this is really more so connected to the to Names the for the one to the uh, uh, um remnant bride workers in the luke connection but let's listen to the rest will take it to be slain no one could have become manifest from among those who have believed in salvation unless that book had appeared for this reason the merciful one the faithful one jesus was patient in accepting suffering until he took that book since he knows that his death is life for many the little children also to whom the knowledge of the father belongs that mystery that was written in that book belongs to the little ones but Christ had to come and open that book. He had to reveal that book. And also we find that according to Luke's gospel, Jesus said to them, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather that your names are written in heaven, written in that very book. Now, again, you might say, though, what does that got to do with over here in, in, about these lads there, right? Okay, I'll show you. The lad represents one of the little ones is what it does. Let's back up and look at it again. At that time, the disciples drew near to Jesus and said to him, Who do you think is great in the kingdom of heaven? He called a small lad and placed him in the midst. 
He said, I say, if you do not turn to become like this lad, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He who receives a lad like this in my name receives me. He who causes one of the small lads, now it's in the plural, causes one of the small lads, the little ones, who believe on me to stumble, it'd be good for him to tie a millstone upon his neck and be cast into the depth of the sea. The one that causes the fall. The little ones were the apostles. They were also the seventy. And one of those little ones did stumble. Judas Iscariot. And the one that caused him to stumble, it was better that a millstone be tied at his, at his neck. He'd be thrown to the depth of the sea. And we know it was the high priest that did it. See, see? <clears throat> what was the whole, the whole build up in it? That the little lad that these little children, so he's reading from a, from a, a what is it, a, 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 a Jewish translation. So it says little lad, little lad, little children, right? These little flocks of the Lord. So what do we know about this? Well, he says that it was Judas Iscariot, right? That this little lad was actually Judas Iscariot. It wasn't the Lord grabbing a little kid walking by it from a group of these little kids and saying, hey, this little kid. No, no, no. It couldn't have been. Because of the wording that we get. Listen to what it says. We're going to read this. Matthew chapter 18. And here's the thing. He's correct in saying Judas Iscariot. He's correct in understanding it from Matthew 18. What do we know is so important about it? One, it's the kingdom of heaven. Remember to Judah, it's the kingdom of heaven. Luke's group and Mark's group go to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is what is coming down that Judah is their millennial reign, ruling and reigning with the Lord. So let's see what it says. At that time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called the little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive such little child in my name receives me. Well, wait a second. Don't you see that right off the bat right there? Why would accepting a little child have anything to do with salvation in Christ. And whosoever receives one such little child. Well, who are the people that people would receive? The 144,000 going out to work? The ones working, going from homes and doing their, their evangelizing in the first half of trumpets and during trumpets? If you're receiving one, and in receiving one, you're receiving Christ. You see, this is how he's made that connection to this little child and being a representation of the apostles, the disciples, and so forth that were there in the is. And that the one that he chose was, was uh, uh, um, Judas. Now listen to what it says next. But, who's, but who so shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned to the depths of the sea. What, what do you mean? Offend one of these little ones which believe in me? What, so just some little kid walking by and he grabs him and says, hey, this little kid believes in me. No, I, I agree with what Stephen Benanun is saying. That it was the apostles and the disciples as he's giving this talk and he's pulling forward Judas. And so what does it say? It were better that a millstone were cast around his neck and that he were drowned, right? Into, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Well, now hold on a second. He says, he goes on to say that he says, well, see, it was the high priest. Well, no, it wasn't. You see, that's where I would differ with him. We know it wasn't the high priest because Judas, we read in Luke 22, verse 3, says, then entered Satan into Judas. 
You see, yes, then entered Satan into Judas. And in verse four, it says, and he went his way and communed with the chief priest. So <clears throat> this is why he would say, uh, um, Ben Danun was saying that, you know, oh, it was the high priest at the time that caused it. No, it was Satan. It was Satan that entered Judas. That's what caused it. And who is being cast into the sea? With a millstone, with, with a chain wrapped around him. Sound familiar? Of course it does, right? If Satan was the one that did this to him, then who's the one going to the bottomless pit? What is the bottomless pit? The abyss. You guys know what the abyss is, right? The abyss of the sea. To the bottomless pit. What does it say about him? Uh, da, 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 having the key to the bottomless pit. And what? A great chain in his hand. And a great chain in his hand. So he gets tied about with a great chain. And he gets cast into the bottomless pit, which is the abyss of the sea. And it was Satan that went and indwelt him that caused them to do these things. Okay? So it was a great little connection. Then there's more to it. So there's this great little connection in seeing the, the conversation that's taking place that it would be the apostles and the disciples at that time and those who were there. And that the picture of this one little one is uh, Judas Iscariot. And that, it, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Judas. And it's whoever offends one of these little ones. And, well, who was it? It was Satan that, that offended Judas that went into him. And in so doing, we see that prophetically, what do we know about the end of days? Who do we read about in Scripture who is the prophetic typology of the son of perdition? Well, Scripture even tells us who the son of perdition was in the is. It was, of course, Judas. And we know from 26 or 27, let's go to 27. I know it's there. In Matthew chapter 27, what do we see about Judas? Here's Judas, and only in Matthew's disc, uh, a gospel, again, we covered this again not too long ago, right? That it says in verse, uh, well, we'll start in verse 8 of Matthew 27. Therefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled <laughs> that which was spoken by the prophet Jer uh, the, by Jeremy the prophet, saying, "And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price that was valued of him, whom the children of Israel did value." Well, we know this being all connected to Judas. Judas in the is was called the son of perdition, and the story of the money being given. In Luke and in Mark, we only read money. Only in Matthew do we read 30 pieces of silver. So when what? When the ancient of days, I mean, when the vintage of old is cast down, which is Satan when he's cast down at mid trumpets, which is in the ten, in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in, just like Revelation 12. And we scroll down and we saw what? Who are the three shepherds? Well, we see that Satan's now there. The, the beast has come back, who's the Antichrist, and the false prophet. There's three of them. And what does the Lord do? He cuts his staff, right? Cuts it asunder that he might break his covenant, and he broke it in that day. And what did they do for him? So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. This is, this is mid-trumpets. This is mid-trumpets. We've shared on this many times. So we're seeing this in the prophetic, the typology of what's taking place here about trumpets and about those who will take part in the kingdom of heaven, which is for Judah. Now, look what happens when we continue this. Uh, verse uh, Matthew 18, verse 9, where he was talking about, and if thine eye uh, offend thee, pluck it out. This word to pluck out or to tear, check it out. It only shows up twice in Matthew's gospel. One, it's in Matthew 5, 29, and the other one in Matthew 18, where we are. So out of all the gospels, this definition of pluck out your eye is only found in Matthew's portion. 
in Matthew 18, 9. Because we know, and he, he goes on to talk a little bit about this, that Judas went to walk over to the high priest. He had to put his hand out to receive the money. He, had, he identified Christ by looking at him, right? And he gave him a kiss. So he did these things that were offensive. But let's keep reading. Because it gets much, much more clear. He talked about um, verse 14. Even so it is not the will of your father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. But what do we see is going to happen? Let me show you this. We keep going down. We come to uh, Matthew 18, 22, and we read about, uh, I say not unto thee until seven times seven, but 70 times seven, right? It's about the forgiveness of your uh, uh, of your brethren, right? That if he comes to you, you forgive him 70 times, seven times. If he comes back and repents and comes to you, we're to forgive him. So let's go to verse 23. Therefore, in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king. Listen to this. Which would take account of his servants. Which would take account of his servants. Well, Christ is king at that point, right? And he's going to take account of his servants. Well, who are the servants at that time when he comes at the end of trumpets? It would be the 144,000, right? That group working during trumpets. That typology of where a line of them or somebody as a Judas type or a group of them fall away, which is why Christ had to do something again. Look at this word take. It's only used three times. So it says, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, it's the same word. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him, listen to this, 10,000 talents. What about like salvation, right? 10,000 times 10,000? Like he should have been involved in bringing forth 10,000 people. Remember when the 144,000 are sealed before the great multitude rapture? When you have the, the great multitude coming in? It would seem that whoever this servant was, that's being when all the servants are being reckoned at the end of trumpets, that there was one that owed 10,000. And listen to what it says. But for as much as he had not uh, to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Yikes, right? This is the Lord prophetically speaking in these, in these uh, uh, um, uh, parables. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I pray thee, and I, I will pay thee all. Then the Lord said of that servant, was sorry, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Look at that. Loosed him, set him at liberty, and what? Forgave him the debt. Used one time. What was he? He was set at liberty and his debts were forgiven. Let's now back up a little bit. Let's look at this word of take and reckon. So the word take and reckon is only used three times. We know it's prophetically speaking to the end of trumpets. Almost even like it's speaking, this reckoning taking place here is happening at the end of the 14th year, when that final year is done. And how do we know this? Well, we're going to cover that because he was loosed and forgiven his debt. We know exactly what that connects to. And we can see that that word for debt was only used one time, so how fitting that it's in Matthew's gospel. But look at this word for take and reckon. 48, 68 in the Greek, it's used three times. 
Let's go have a look where that is. Check it out. It's used three times. Twice as we just saw in Matthew 18. So if, if Matthew 18 is truly a prophetic picture of, of, of the one like Satan who came into Judas Iscariot, and that what Stephen Ben Danoon is really understanding is truly Judas Iscariot, which, which is what I'm proving it is by the story that continues. <laughs> and we know that it was Satan that did this to him, that deceived him and, and, and took over him. And we see that it's Satan that's cast into the sea, which is the abyss, the pit, with the chain put around him. Then this storyline is connected to the end of trumpets. When Satan is cast into the pit, the Lord destroys all the things of the enemy. And now he's coming to get account of the 144,000. That typology of those workers. And what do we see? Which would take account of his servants and that one was brought to him, which owed him. What would he owe? Souls. Souls. Remember what happened? Like I was saying, if we go into John, when you get to John 15, it's a prophetic picture of the seven years of trumpets that remain. And it's what? There, Jesus is the, is the vine. The father is the husbandman. Every branch, they're all to produce fruit, to produce fruit. If they don't produce fruit, what happens? They're going to get cut off. Ta-da. They're going to get cut off. So the 144,000 are to produce fruit. And if they're not bringing in their portion, you see, because he owes them 10,000, he's going to be cut off. And what, what happened within this? Well, it was the deception of Satan. So if we can see that this, and I'm going to reveal more, that this is truly a prophetic picture of the end of the 14 years, how else can I show that it's a prophetic picture of the end of 14 years? Watch this. Let's go back into 18. Remembering that these two are telling us it's the end of the 14. And I'm going to prove it to you by going a little bit further when it says, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, which means also set at liberty and forgave him his debt. And this word debt is only used here in Matthew one time. Why is this important? How do these things all together prove that it's the final year prophetically of trumpets? Well, for that, we go to Leviticus chapter 25. And what do we read about the Jubilee year? Verse 8. When is the Jubilee year? Well, let's go to our fantastic calendar or, or, or Sabbath year chart. With the Jubilee counts, remember that's the Jubilee that goes all the way from Luke 3 into 4. And in chapter 4, Jesus was proclaiming the, the year of the Jubilee being at hand. We counted those Sabbath years and the Jubilees. And the final Jubilee is right there. 2038 to 2039, Feast of Trumpets and 10 days later to Atonement is where the Jubilee trumpet is sounded. Because, right, right here. It's right here. This is the end of the 14 years. This is the final year of the Lord. He was here for that 14th year. So where are we talking about now? We're talking about being at the end. We're talking about being at the end of the Lord's year as it was the ones of Noah. Okay? Remember the, the, the year of Noah in, in uh, Matthew 24? As it was in the days of Noah? We know that that represents the final year. The Lord has come at the end of the 13th year or sixth year of trumpets. Here he is coming feet down. It's the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. And it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. The days of Noah was a year and 10 days. So when the year and 10 days is over, it's atonement. And what is it? It's the Jubilee. What happens in the Jubilee year? Well, it's at the end of seven Sabbaths, right? Seven times seven. Well, that's what's happened. Seven, 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 seven from the last Jubilee. This is your final Jubilee. At the end of 14 years, it's the 15th year is the beginning of the millennial reign. It's the Jubilee. And what does it say? 
Leviticus 25, 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths shall be unto thee 49 years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, and uh, uh, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the 50th year, and what? Proclaim liberty. He's proclaiming liberty. He's setting at liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, and it shall be a jubilee to you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. What was he going to do? He set him at liberty. He forgave him his debt, and he didn't take his family. Hello. He was going to take his family. He was going to take, he owed him the debt. You see? Clearly telling you that in Matthew 18, he's forgiving him at the time of the Jubilee. At the time of the Jubilee, which is at the end of the 14 years, right at the start of the Jubilee. By loosening and forgiving the debt, and he never ends up then taking his family because it's a jubilee. So how can I prove that it really is besides the jubilee? Well, we saw the word reckon. The word reckon was used three times. The third time is, you guessed it, Matthew chapter 25, verse 19. What is Matthew 25? <clears throat> it's the end. It follows Matthew 24. It's still the discourse. And in Matthew, the end of Matthew 24, it was about who? Well, we're going to cover that in a moment. But what is Matthew 25? It's when that final year is over. It's 13 years. There's a, a brief wedding, right, where it's commitment. They're, they're married officially. And then he prepares a place for one year. And then what does he do? He goes to get his bride after the 14th year. At the trumpet blast, the day and hour, no one knows, right? For the marriage, and the door is shut. We know, and we've taught on this, this is the end of the 14th year, just like the end of the final year of Noah. And look at what we get. Matthew 25, verse 14. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Hello. Hello. The exact same prophetic understanding of what 18 is telling you. That, yes, that Judas Iscariot, if you should cause one of these to fall. And who was it? Well, it was Satan. So Satan, for that, for that offense, is going to be bound in the pit, cast into the sea. And he's going to be there for a thousand years. And now Iscariot, because of this stumble, because of the fall that he did, what happens? Well, here we are at the end of trumpets now. The 14 years are over. He's returning for, for the wedding at the final end of the 14th year. The Jewish wedding, not the pre-trib wedding, the Jewish wedding. And we see him now coming to the servants. And saying, now, show unto me what you did. <laughs> and what was the picture in Matthew 18? He owed him 10,000. And he didn't have it. He owed him 10000 and he didn't have it. And what do we find out about the slothful and wicked servant? The slothful and wicked servant ends up what? Verse 30, Matthew 25, verse 30. And cast ye the unprofitable what? Servant. Servant. These are the ones who are serving the Lord. There's, there's the first group, there's the which is the Luke group. There's the 144,000, which is the second group, which is this one. And then there's the third group of servants, which worked during the millennial reign. This is a servant from the 144, typologied as Judas. Whether it's just a Judas type as a singular, or whether it'll be a small group of people, I don't know. But the unprofitable ser servant will be cast out of outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
You see, what ends up happening? He's not cast into hell, right? He's cast out into the utter darkness for how long? For the thousand years. For the thousand years. You see? Then what's going to happen in the judgment, right? But he's cast out for those th for the thousand years. This is that same servant. And listen, let's keep going in Matthew 18. You're going to be able to you're going to be able to follow this track this the whole way through. Now listen to this. But the same servant went out. Now listen to what happens. So this servant who was just loosed, who was just set at liberty and his debts canceled and his family not taken because it was this proclamation time of the Jubilee, the Lord sets him free. And then what does he turn around and do? But the same servant, so this same Judas servant type in the end of days, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what thou owest me. Yikes, right? And so the Lord says, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. See, it's not even the same debt because it's a different typology. It's a different account, right? So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. And this Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servants? even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. Only used one time in Matthew. Oh, he's going to get away. He's going to be forgiven. Boom. Nope. He's going to the tormentors. Now watch this. Who is this group? What, what is the connection to him? Well, look at this wording that we find. Right in Matthew 20, uh, in Matthew 18, 27, look at what it says. Matthew 18, 20, was it 27? Matthew 18, 27. The Lord of that servant. Okay, I went to look up the, the phrase. The Lord of that servant, okay? So this is the Lord himself because he's forgiving the debt at the Jubilee at the end of the 14 years. So it's almost like, oh, Judas, something is going to be forgiven, but no, 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 because his heart still wasn't right, right? So look at what we see, the Lord of that servant. Where do we see this term, the Lord of that servant? Do you think this is by chance? Let's go to Matthew 24, 50. Matthew chapter 24, come on, verse 50. So now where are we? Matthew 24, we've already come to the point where we're now at the final year, right? We're at the final 14th year. The Lord has come as lightning, right? The tribes of the earth shall mourn. There he was coming on the clouds. It's the day and hour no one knows because it's the feast of trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. It's the coming of the Lord as the days of Noah. Okay? All of it is connected. Connected to his coming, to his coming. They had no idea. We see this, this, this watching that he might come as a thief. If the thief had watched, he would have known and wouldn't have suffered his house to have been broken into. Okay? All of these things. This is all about those that the 144,000 sealed at the end of six years or the start of the seventh year of seals, that group from the end of Mark's gospel, that work during trumpets, which is Matthew's discourse. You see? So we see that that second watch group, these things happen to them, to a portion or a Judas type and, and maybe a small group with them. And listen to what it says. <clears throat> Verse 48, but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming 
and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The, the Lord of that servant shall come, see, then the Lord of that servant. There's that same term. Then the Lord of that servant shall come at a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour when he is not aware of him. And listen to this. And shall cut him asunder. And shall cut him asunder. Watch where this is as well. Okay? It's only used twice. It's only used twice. And where it is is perfect. And shall cut him asunder. And appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what happened? You had that, here he is, if they weren't watching, and there's still that one more year after the wedding, right? And then what did we get? We got in in uh, uh, um, uh, 25, which is the end of that 14th year, after the time of, like, Noah. And what happened to that slothful, wicked servant when the reckoning came? He got cast out, the unprofitable servant, to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So where else do we find this to, to confirm this, this understanding in the groups of workers? We know it's not the first group of workers, right? So, so when Ben Danun is talking about the, the little children and, and that whole story, the exciting part for him is the fact that it was the realization that it was the apostles and the disciples in the is of the events that happened, not just some little kid walking by. It was literally those who already believed in him and were going around and professing him to others. That was the entire context of the conversation. So that's what was really exciting. In the prophetic, we can see that Matthew 18 is clearly talking about this Judas, just as he was saying it was, and how it's directly tied into the end of days. Not this first group. You see that he was mixing it with in Revelation 4, or, uh, you know, and then he was getting it right by going to Luke 10, but not realizing that th this pre-group in the in the seals compared to the a mid trumpets group. We know it's not the first group because it's this is the Luke group. Let your loins be girded about when he returns from the wedding. He knocks you open immediately. He's going to come and serve you and sit down with you. That's the Luke 24 group. They'll be with him for 40 days and they'll go out during seals. Then it says in Luke 12, 38. And if he shall come in the second watch or in the third watch, blessed are those servants. And then it says, and this know that if the good man of the house had known at which hour the thief would come, he would have watched. Well, where do we get this conversation? We don't get it at the end of Luke's portion of discourse. We don't get it in Mark's. We get it in Matthew's. You see, Matthew's is the 144 from the end of Mark's group. That works during trumpets, which is Matthew's discourse. And then it says, uh, verse 40, Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. And Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even unto all? See, it's kind of interesting, right? So when Peter's saying this now, is this has always kind of been a mystery. Is Peter saying, Lord, are you talking to us as just being the apostles or is it the apostles and disciples? Right? Or is it just everybody that's now there listening? Well, based on what we're understanding, he's talking to the apostles and the disciples. He's talking to the workers, his servants, for which everybody that was listening isn't his servant, unless the only group there were the apostles and the disciples. Okay? And then he says, verse 42, uh, and the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom when his Lord shall make him ruler over his household to give him his meat in due season, blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall, shall, shall so find doing. Remember when he's going to reconcile everything, right? When he's going to reckon it all, the rest of them did good, except this one. Um, of a truth I say unto you, he will make him ruler over all that he hath, but and if, man, these are scary words in scripture. But and if means it will happen. 
right? If you continue in the Lord, right? But and if. It's it, terrifying words in scripture. So, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, hello, and shall begin to beat the manservants and maidens. You see how I was connecting it with the other one? What was he saying? There would be workers, there would be a group serving the Lord, like the Johns and the Elijahs, and there are manservants and maidservants, right? All of it's connected to this, to these remnant worker groups. So what is he doing? He's then turning around and beating on some of the 144,000, right? That that vile, that wicked servant. Um, and to eat and to drink and be drunken. Isn't this exactly what we just read in Matthew chapter 24? The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and an hour when he is not aware and will what? Listen to this. Here it is the second time. Cut him asunder. You see? It's the same one. So sometimes people wonder, well, if you're in Luke, why is there stuff of the 144,000 like in Luke 10? Well, because you got to remember, Luke knows all things in order. Luke chapter 1, right? He knew all things in order from the beginning. So he has a, he can share insight on all of these other parts and pieces. That's why you have all three watches discussed in Luke. Because it's from the beginning. Whereas Mark isn't from the beginning and Matthew isn't from the beginning. Luke is from in the beginning, you see? The spirit portion. So he knows, he, he was there. He was a witness, like John the Baptist said, right? He was a witness of the light. Christ became light on uh, in verse 3 of Genesis 1, when the Lord made him light, that was Christ. Christ was the beginning in spirit. Christ was made light. Okay. And then when he came in the flesh, 2000 or so years ago, so he was the spirit, the light, and then he was made flesh. And he was made flesh for what Adam, the first flesh, fell for. Okay. But look at this. So we've got this cut asunder as well. So we can clearly know who this group is talking to. There's no confusion needed. We know it's talking to the second of the three watches. It's all about the second watch that's in trouble here. The first watch isn't in trouble. The third watch are those at the end of Matthew that go out during the millennial reign to teach the ways of the Lord, and he's with them until the end of the world. You see? They're, so they're not waiting for the coming of the Lord. The second group is waiting for the coming of the Lord when he's going to be as lightning from one end to the other. So it's the second watch group. So all of this warning is coming to the second watch group, which is represented by the 144,000. So, and then it says, and he will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, uh, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes, and the one who didn't uh, will be beaten with less, but there's still stuff required. So again, who are who are the ones beaten with stripes? Who's going to have more of a beating, less of a beating? Those who knew they should have been doing better, right? Those who knew they should have been watching and praying. Those who knew in the time of tribulation that they were serving the Lord. They will all be aware of it. The 144,000 are sealed by the angels, and then they're standing on Mount Zion with the Lord. They're sealed with the Father's name in them, in, in their forehead. So this is why we know of a something again that must take place, right? Because there's going to have to be a saving for that one because he's not allowed to be left behind. He's a servant of the Lord. Hello. That's why the again has to take place. But it looks like he's going to have to endure the, the gnashing of teeth, right? The millennial reign. He was set at liberty and his debt was forgiven. It's all in Luke and it's related to the second watch group. And that second watch group is fully described to us in Matthew chapter 24. And the typology 
of that figure is Judas Iscariot. It's awesome. And it all related back to this great little clip of seeing this in relation to what Stephen Benanoon found. And it was exciting to see it in, in an is understanding. It was very exciting to comprehend it. But in an is to come, it reveals even more. Because we understand that the kingdom of heaven is not for the pre-trib and mid-trib group. It's for the post-trib group. It's these workers, these little children that are working during trumpets. And the one who falls, the one who does this slipping and falling and causing this stuff, who is the wicked and the vile servant, is none other than everybody, uh, uh, than, than the same one we've been saying over and over again from different angles that the typology, <laughs> even to the end of days, is the Judas Iscariot type, who in the trumpet's time, as that typology within the 144 falls, for which it brings us back to Hebrews chapter 6, the reason why he must do something afresh. Awesome stuff, man. It's just so wild to see these things just pull them out. And you see, how are we able to do these things, guys? It's the revelation. The books have opened. It's not a maybe. It's not a kind of. It's absolutely. They have opened, guys. We have understood these things. And we're able to take it, as I keep saying, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. We can show from when he comes as high priest king Melchizedek, who is who is the Messiah Ben Joseph, who is the 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 Joshua type who brings them into the promised land, who is bringing the great multitude when he comes, whose connection is with purple at that time, like we did even in the previous video, to show that there is a remnant group. There is a group being prepared who are a, an, an Elijah, John the Baptist, as well as Moses types, who will work during this time of seals, but that it cannot be a type during the apostasy, but that we are going to end the apostasy before another apostasy comes at mid-trumpets and show that when that apostasy comes and this great falling away takes place, Judas Iscariot's typology is the one as the typology with the son of perdition or explained as the son of perdition who isn't going to be free at the end, you see? Because he turns around and what does he do? He turns around and he does the exact opposite as what was granted to him and he's now going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth as that wicked servant from the lord it's awesome guys to be able to see these things to be able to to weave them together in understanding as others are seeing parts and pieces but are doing what the church has always done which is when it comes to prophecy mixing and mashing just like uh like mashed potatoes you know scrambling it all together but it's awesome to see these parts and pieces that excite them in revealing parts that they're getting and that we could build on them, bring clarity to them and grow in our understanding and help others understand it as well. God is good. The spirit is leading brothers and sisters. He is leading in the word. It, it's happening. You all know where I believe it is. We are absolutely all eyes watching for middish june but really prayerfully that would be it but really this is our time right here watching and praying 2024 and why is it so important because we've been able we've been able to show you that the end of tribulation the final year whether you believe in seven years or the truth of 14 years 
your final seven must end and be followed by a jubilee. And this chart, which you can find in the description box under the video, reveals account from the time of Christ when he made the declaration. And it equals right here. This is something, guys, that should get you so, so excited. We know, everybody knows that the time of Christ would argue from between 28 AD to 34-ish AD. With that understanding, we can show 28 AD when Jesus would have said those words in Luke chapter 4 is out of the picture. 29 AD is out. Out of, I mean, uh, um, 28 to 29 is out of the picture. So you got to understand, he wasn't saying this at the end of his testimony. He was saying it uh, like two months in. Okay. So when we say 33, 34, or 32, or whatever, when he died, we got to go back three to four years, right? So when you go back, people would say, well, he started in 20, what, 6, 27. And others will say 28. Others will say 29. Others will say 30. Do you know what that means? That means that even if you don't want to believe in this count, that in uh, 2024 is when it all begins, you can't be more than in this range right here. I want you guys to just let that sink in. Of course, the last two years, it couldn't be. They're gone. And we showed this count based on the, the reign of Tiberius Caesar in Luke chapter 3, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, that little clue that the scriptures give us, lead us to account that from 29 AD, this declaration that began with the Lord that the Jubilee was at hand gives us the Jubilee ending right here. So wherever you believe your seven years end, or where the true of 14 years ends, it must be followed by the true by a jubilee. And the revelation from scripture in the count revealed right here. It's exciting, guys. It is mind-blowingly exciting. We should all be excited. We should all be rejoicing. I know that we still have issues. We're still having to deal with life things, right? Some brothers and sisters, you know, a brother had just messaged me, a dear friend of his had just passed, a partner of his, and, you know, it's painful. But we can rejoice, guys. Many are struggling financially. January is, a, is a, such a difficult time for ministry. Always is for everybody. I get it. But we can rejoice. We can rejoice. I firmly, fully believe that we have given all of the evidence to show 2024 is the year. And you keep seeing all of these revelations that continue to reveal themselves to us. Man, oh man. Man, oh man. Every single day, I'm in awe by what the Lord has given us to understand in him. I'm blown away. I can never, ever get over it. I will never get over it. It's so incredible. We have been so blessed. And I can't wait to see what he will continue to draw us closer in to understand. Brothers and sisters, we are at the door. We've only got a few months to go. We will continue to strengthen, to lift each other up, to draw closer, to diligently seek, be repentant. I love you guys. I love your families. We pray for you every night. God bless you all. Bye for now.